Welcome to Shenandoah National Park. I'm Ranger Ginny, and we are here today in Rapidan Camp, which was the summer White House of President Herbert Hoover and a fishing camp. We know that President Hoover was president during the 1920 stock market crash and during the beginning years of the Depression. But beyond that, what do we really know about him? Well, to help understand what it was like and why he had Rapidan Camp, it'd be interesting to look at some of his background in history. Hoover was born in 1874 in Iowa, the son of a blacksmith and a Quaker minister. He loved being out of doors from a very young age, and fishing was where he found quiet and relaxation. Unfortunately, by the time he was 10, he was an orphan, and he was sent to live with an aunt and an uncle in Oregon. He continued his love of the out of doors, even all the way across the country. He continued his schooling in Oregon and finished his secondary education at a Quaker school then he went on to be the youngest member of the first class at Stanford University, where he was able to major in geology and mining engineering. Both of those he hoped would give him an opportunity to be out of doors as much as possible. He got to Stanford four years tuition free, but he had to work very hard to earn his room and board. While he was at Stanford, he met his future wife, Lou Henry, who was there as the first female geology student at Stanford University. He, Herbert, graduated ahead of her and went on to do mining engineering in the gold fields of California and then was hired by an English company and went on to do mining in Australia. When Lou graduated, he came back from Australia and they were married and they went together to the next mining assignment that the Hoovers had which was in China. Now they ended up in China in the early 1900s and the Boxer Rebellion was going on. Unfortunately, the community, the mining community where the Hoovers were sent was put under siege by the Boxers and it's there in China in the early 1900s that Hoover began what became a lifelong career in humanitarian service. What he did was organize the rationing of food and set up an infirmary for the wounded and sick. That humanitarian service is something that will go with him through the rest of his life. Fortunately, they got out of China healthy and well. They went back to London and made London their home base because that was the home base of the company for whom he worked. And then um, he was able to develop quite the reputation as an international miner. He was doing well enough that he decided that he would set up his own mining consulting business. Then he became known as the doctor of sick mines. He was able to go into these failing mining operations and with that excellent education and experience, turn them around to produce again. By the time World War I started in 1914 in Europe, Herbert Hoover, orphan boy of no means, had become a multimillionaire. Something that he said later in life is a quote that says, my country owes me nothing. It gave me, as it gives every boy and girl, a chance. It gave me schooling, independence of action, opportunity for service and honor. And that was something by which Hoover lived the rest of his life. I'm standing here on the footbridge that crosses the mill prong here in Rapidan Camp, one of the two streams that come together to form the headwaters of the Rapidan River. That was key when it came to where President Hoover chose his uh, fishing camp and summer White House. He had three simple criteria he wanted to follow in finding the place. One was that it was close to Washington, an easy day trip in a car. Two was that it needed to be in the mountains so it would be cooler 
away from the oppressive heat of Washington in the summer. And the third one, and maybe most important to Hoover, was that it had to have good trout fishing. This is one of the two streams here. Before construction actually began on the camp, the Marines got involved because one of the tasks they do is learning how to build things, roads and buildings, and the President agreed that that would be helpful here since what he intended for the camp was to leave this as a retreat for future presidents. That seemed like a good idea. So not only did we have the President's Rapidan camp, there was also a fully functional Marine camp down here during the time that Hoover was president. The camp itself was designed originally to be canvas tents, and that was the way it was. They didn't know how often they would be here. The idea to change to fully wooden structures came quickly, though, when they realized how much they enjoyed it and they were utilizing the camp. At the height of the building, there were 13 wooden structures as well as some stone features and all of that is to say that the presidents never intended for this to be just a cabin in the woods for them, by themselves. They were very social people and always intended to have many guests and visitors here with them. When the original deed was signed for this place, it incorporated 164 acres. And what the deed said was this would belong to the president as long as he was president. When he was no longer executive of this country, it was to be given to the government as a gift and to become home of the future Shenandoah National Park. Lou Hoover was very much involved in the design and construction here at Rapidan Camp. Let's now take a look at what the rest of the camp looked like. As you can see, we are at the Brown House. This was the home of Herbert and Lou Henry Hoover while they were here at Rapidan Camp. The name is an absolute nod to the color of the house. He lived in the White House in Washington and in the Brown House down here at Rapidan Camp. There was lots of great outdoor living space where they could enjoy the cool mountain air. There was also a nod to Lou's conservation efforts. She didn't want any trees cut except those that were absolutely necessary. And there is um, what's left of the hole where a tree was growing out. And if you look at the roof, you'll notice that there's also an accommodation on the roof. Unfortunately, in the years since the Hoovers were here, the tree had to be removed because it was damaging the roof on the house. But otherwise, Lou had um, made sure that there was plenty of um, shade here on the porch of the house. You are welcome to see the inside of the Brown House by taking a virtual 3D tour of the house. You need to log on to the Shenandoah National Park website and follow the directions there for being able to see what the house looked like as it did when the Hoovers were here in the early 1930s. This outdoor fireplace was only ever an outdoor fireplace. It was never attached to a building. It was a place where they would come and congregate in the evening, sit on logs, just having a quiet time in the cool evening. It was also a place where President Hoover used to come and occasionally would cook over the open fire. He would serve his friends sometimes breakfast of sausage and eggs, sometimes dinner he would cook them beef. This is the Creel. This cottage was built specifically for two people, Lawrence Ritchie, the president's personal secretary, and Dr. Joel Boone, who was the president's personal physician. Those two men were in camp almost every time the camp was occupied, and they shared this cottage together. It was something that the president set aside for two very close companions. Today, it is used in, as a place 
for our interns and our volunteers to live who take care of Rapidan Camp and greet visitors when they come. None of the cabins here in Rapidan Camp had a kitchen in them, not even the president's. Everybody was expected to eat in the mess hall. This is the site of where the mess hall used to stand, and behind me you're able to see what's left of the outdoor grill. Even back in the president's time, they enjoyed grilling outside just like we do today. The dining hall or the mess hall was designed to fit about 20 people in it. The president always came down here with guests and business associates. And Lou was very much in charge of the atmosphere in the dining hall. She wanted to have certain rules followed regularly. One of them was you could never sit with your own spouse at a meal that was not being social. And for heaven's sake, there was to be no shop talk. Behind me, we have this stone structure, which was a water fountain. Lou wanted that lovely sound of running water here in the camp, and so it was designed to have water flow through a pipe, gravity fed. It comes out the top of the structure and flows over the rims of the concentric circles and down into these little receiving pools here. Ultimately, it drains into Hemlock Run and goes out into the Rapidan River, but it was just a nice water feature that Lou had for the park. You have to use your imagination as you are looking around Rapidan Camp. When the Hoovers were here in 1929, this was a hemlock grove. There were scores of mature hemlock trees here. Unfortunately, about 30 years ago, here in Shenandoah National Park, we were invaded with an insect called the hemlock woolly adelgid, and it has killed about 70% of all the hemlock trees here in Shenandoah. We are fortunate that there are still a few of them that are standing in Rapidan Camp, but we don't have the high shady canopy that we would have had had the hemlock still been here. The Hoover's idea for the camp was that all of the structures were to be canvas tents. They didn't know how often they would be here and tents would be satisfactory in the short term. They got here and loved it, so all of the buildings eventually ended up being wooden structures. They kept the name Five Tents. It was the first place the Hoover's ever spent the night, and it is the only one of the lodgings that are not built along one of the two streams here, Laurel Prong or Mill Prong. Today, if we go up to see it, there isn't anything left of the structure, but what we do have up there is the stone fireplace that was left from the building when it was enclosed. The Hoovers love the sound of the running water, found it very relaxing and we're not above changing the environment around here to add to that. We have Laurel Prong and Mill Prong already, but the president designed and the Marines dug another source of water here called Hemlock Run because it came right through the Hemlock Grove here. This was a stone footbridge built by the Marines to go across the Hemlock Run, and it follows a path up into um, the rest of the camp that was known as the President's Walk. Back this walkway, there were four other cottages that were built. One of them was specifically set aside for secretaries and stenographers to keep track and official records for the Hoovers while they were doing business here at Rapidan Camp. This cabin was called the Prime Minister as a nod to the Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1929, Ramsay MacDonald. He was very, he, Ramsay MacDonald, was very concerned about the naval buildup in Europe after World War I and contacted President Hoover to discuss what could be done about that. He, MacDonald and Hoover, saw that it would be in their best interest to have a face-to-face -face meeting about that, and Hoover invited him here to the United States. I'm fairly certain that Ramsey McDonald expected to stay at the White House, although President Hoover had a different idea for that. He met him on the portico at the White House and informed the Prime Minister that they would be going camping for the week. 
he stayed in this cottage a, away from the prying eyes of the press and they were able to really work out some details that became a naval disarmament agreement, one of the true positive accomplishments of Hoover's administration. You would be able, by logging on to the Shenandoah National Park website, to take a virtual tour inside of the Prime Minister's cottage. It is set up as an exhibit now and has lots of great information about the Hoovers and the Prime Minister. President Hoover loved to fish. It was one of the reasons why he chose this spot along the Rapidan River and the Mill Prong and Laurel Prong. He also was very proud of the type of fish that were here in the streams, whether people like to fish or not. What we have here was known as the Trout Pond, and it was built specifically so that he could display fish. Did it have the day's catch before it got fried up at the mess hall for dinner? Maybe, but they were definitely fish that resided here full time. We know this because, bless Lou Hoover, she kept great records. And what she did was write down that they stopped at a meat market in Washington and bought beef hearts to come down and she and Herbert in the evening would come out and feed the fish that were here in the trout pond. In 1941, when we entered World War II, he tried to help domestically but was not given the opportunity. But that did not mean that he was going to end his humanitarian service. What he did, because Belgium suffered again, was resurrect the Commission for the Relief of Belgium and started the Finnish Relief Fund. In 1944, unexpectedly, in New York City, Lou Henry Hoover died, and the president was devastated by that. In 1945, Roosevelt died, and at that point when Truman took over, President Truman asked Hoover to work in the Food Administration for the national government again, which was something he had done admirably well during World War I. When that was over, he was asked to serve on the Hoover Commission, which was to rejuvenate and revitalize the executive branch of the government, served that under Truman and a second one under Eisenhower. Then, in 1958, he was asked by President Eisenhower to represent the United States at the World's Fair that year in Brussels, Belgium. Herbert Hoover died in New York City in October of 1964 at age 90. He lived a long and dedicated life. What we remember of Herbert Hoover largely is the four years of his presidency. And if we just look at that short amount of time, we somehow find him lacking. But if you look at the larger picture of Hoover's life, and see the humanitarian service that he had over 60 years in compiling, we somehow get a different view of Hoover from that. He was even willing to give his home here to the Shenandoah National Park so that millions of people could continue to enjoy it.